Second one is First Samuel 16, 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Please join me in prayer. Dear Lord, we just come before you. And we recognize that you are God. You are such an awesome God. And as we heard in the music today, Lord, we truly want to worship you. We want to hear your voice. We want to see your face. In the scripture we have just read, Lord, we will see your face. And Lord, that is just such a, an awesome promise you've made to us. As we open the scripture and open your word today, open our hearts as well. That may we receive that word and we may truly understand it, have the wisdom that can only come from you to apply it in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And if you look at the scripture message, the title for today, um, I titled it, A Pure Heart in an Impure World. And if you look at that, we do live in an impure world. This world we live in is far from perfect. Um, there are so many things that we have to deal with day to day. But um, what I want to look at is the word pure. When we look at Matthew 5.8, it said, blessed are the pure in heart. Now the word pure, when you look at the Greek, the Greek word for that is katharos. And there's actually multiple meanings for that. But in this context of the Bible, um, it's really meant to, to say anything that, that soils or corrupts or sticks to you or makes you dirty. Um, it also means unstained or unmixed. So when you look at that, um, that suggests basically two things, two meanings. First, it means to make pure by cleansing from dirt or filth or being contaminated. And it was most often used to describe metals as they were being refined, like the metal gold. To, to have pure gold, what you have to do is heat it and remove the, the dross from the gold, and then you have pure gold. So it was often used in that context as well. But it, it means to be free from impurities. Um, it also was talking about having soiled clothes. And you know if you're wearing white pants, no matter what you do, if you wear white pants or a white shirt, you just see how dirty that really gets. I mean, if you wear dark clothes, you really don't notice it. But if you're wearing light colored clothes, you see all those little spots that get on you throughout the day. Um, but you know, once those clothes, once they've been washed clean, um, it's, it's totally different. It was also used to describe not only clothes, but also back in the day with grain. When they used to sift the grain, they used, when they sifted it, it would remove the chaff and they'd only be left with the kernels of the grain. So what you had was pure grain. And the second meaning was unmixed, which means having no double allegiance, being you know, double-minded. Um, in his commentary on this passage, Warren Weisberg wrote, the basic idea is that integrity, singleness of heart, as opposed, as opposed to duplicity or a divided heart. And we look at that, what Jesus told us too, um, Jesus, as you recall in the, in the Bible, he told us that we cannot serve two masters. Either you will hate the one or the other, or love the other one. You know, you can only be divided or devoted, excuse me, to one, one master. And what Jesus was telling us there in that scripture was he wanted us to have a single mind, one pure, unmixed mind. Also in the book of James, this is a pretty well-known scripture, but in chapter 1, verse 8, James tells us that a double-minded person is unstable. So if your mind is thinking two different things, you can't concentrate. And in everything you do, it will be unstable. You know, when we look at this and we put the two definitions together, if you truly have a passion for purity, what that's saying is you will be cleansed. You should have not only your heart cleansed, but your character as well. And we were talking about this this morning in Bible study. It was, it was no accident. It's how you act 
when you're not around people, how you act in, in private. You should be acting the same way in private that you do in public. You should have one mind, one, one character. Um, as someone once said, you know, your character should be is what, what you do when no one is looking. Um, you should have that single mind, and we need to be, have that single mind and be committed to Christ. Not only in our mind, but inwardly as well. And that's what Jesus is talking about here this morning when he's talking about the heart. Now, when you look at the word pure, many things come to mind. Um, in the physical sense, we like pure drinking water. I know we like to have crystal clear water to drink. Um, what about the air we breathe? We like to have fresh, pure air. What are the foods we like to eat? A lot of people now are eating organic foods because they don't want foods that are contaminated with pesticides or other things. But all of those things go into our body, and we need those things to have a healthy body and to live. But when you focus on the word pure, have you ever, and this might, guys might relate to this better than women, but uh, and I know I've done it on many occasions, men like to drink out of the milk carton. We like to open the refrigerator and just grab it and take a, a chug out of the milk. And I know my mom used to get on us. We had five boys in the family and my dad. Uh, my wife does it to me this day. My son drinks out of it. But, you know, if, have you ever done that? Grab the, a carton of milk and just get ready to take a big old nice gulp of cool milk, but to find out it's been in there too long and it's sour? Man, that, that's got to be one of the worst tastes in the world is having that sour milk in your mouth. And to try to get that out, you can't get it out fast enough. You go over to the sink, spit it out, and you try to rinse your mouth out. But, but that's not pure at all. That's, that's sour milk. Also, another thing, driving over here in Korea, there's a lot of diesel vehicles. And I know this time of year and in the spring, I like to drive with the windows down, get nice cool air coming through the car. But have you ever gotten behind a bus or a truck or another diesel car that's in front of you? And that air just gets in the car and it, it almost makes you instantly sick or nauseous because the air, the fumes get to you. But that air is not pure. You know, it's not clean air at all. And, uh, but that's in, that's in the physical sense about pure things. But what does the Bible tell us about purity? Like I said, scholars told us it means clean, not contaminated, or being unmixed. And in today's Bible verse, Jesus says, what? He said, God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. And that's so encouraging. If you look at this verse, we have two things. First of all, we're going to be blessed. But being blessed means being happy, being overjoyed. Not only that, but it's talking about our hearts. Um, and the second part of that verse is, for they will see God. So there's a second part, and that's the promise. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. You know, in the message, a contemporary paraphrase of the Bible, it says, you are blessed when you get your inside world, your mind or your heart, pure and right. Then you can see God in the outside world. So if you're right on the inside, that should reflect to what you see in the outside world and what's going on in your environment. And notice that the emphasis here is what? On the inside, right? Not the outside. It's in the heart. And when you look at the, the term, the heart, when we look at that in the physical sense, we think of the heart that we have that beats, you know, pumps blood and keeps us alive. But in scriptural, it means um, much more than that. It's the center of man's being. It's more than just your heart. What is it? It's your personality. It's your mind. It's your will. And this makes up the total man. You know, what we think, how we feel, what motivates us, what are impulses and passions, all that flows out of your heart, how you feel. And that should be the very core of the human being, of our being. And if you want to know what a person is truly like, you need to look at what they are on the inside. Um, you need to look at the things that flow out of their heart, you know, what comes out um, when they speak, when they act, how they, how they deal with situations. You know, and that's why Jesus emphasized, blessed are the pure in heart. And that's what he was talking about, the heart. He's talking about the true man. And not very, merely on what's on the surface, but the deeper meaning. And it's not only what we see and say, but it's how we act. It's, it's very deep. You know, and here's an interesting thought. When God looks at you, he pays little or no attention to your outward appearance. God really doesn't care what we look like on the outside. 
You know, I'm sorry about that, but um, I know a lot of people spend a lot of times on how they look, fixing their hair, the makeup, the clothes they wear. But God really isn't concerned with any of that. Um, I know a lot of people, especially me, it takes a lot of time and effort to, to get yourself looking good sometimes. So, but we spend a lot of time on that, and we shouldn't really be focused on our outward appearance. It's the in, inside we need to be looking at. And what comes to mind was a quote by one of our, our most famous presidents, Abraham Lincoln. He, he said, you know, if I were, if I were two-faced, would I be wearing this face? So I mean, when you look at that, you gotta really take a look at yourself and not be concerned with what you look like, but be more focused on the inside. You know, God doesn't care what we look like on the outside because he's too busy looking inside to what we are on the inside. You know, what's going on in our heart? And that's what he's more concerned with. You know, Jesus, in his day, he really got worked up over um, a lot of different people. He, he, he picked on the Pharisees a lot of times. And, uh, you know, the people, especially the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, they were more concerned about looking good in public, um, wearing the right clothes. They wanted to pray where people could see them, hear their prayers, and see how they acted. You know, their hair was always fixed up nice. They were always washed and cleansed. Um, and they loved to stand out in prominent places in the temples or on the street corner where people would hear them praying. But, you know, that was a nice show they were putting on. <clears throat> but that's all it really was. It was just a show, an external show. But what Jesus, he really saw all through their pettiness and the pretense to what was inside their hearts. You know, on one occasion, he used the words of Isaiah to, to describe them. He said... These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And by the way, Jesus was talking about who? He was talking about the Pharisees. So these were the church leaders. These were people who were in church. They were in the temple. So these were supposedly religious people. Or for lack of a better term, they were church folk, like we are here nowadays. You know, Jesus said on another occasion that these folks, he called them whitewashed tombs. And uh, what's significant about that is if you go to a, a graveyard and you see a pretty tomb, especially one that's white or made out of marble, and it's very well taken care of, it's, so, it's beautiful, it's clean on the outside. But when you look at a tomb, what is on the inside of a tomb? You have a dead body, a rotting corpse. And that's what Jesus said about the Pharisees. They were clean on the outside, but on the inside they were dead and rotting. When you looked at the Pharisees, they always kept the law. They were very meticulous. Um, for instance, they always washed their hands before they ate. That was one example. They, before, they, before they ate, before anything went into their mouth, they always had to wash their hands because they were concerned about something on the external making them unclean on the internal. But you know, when you look at them, what really came out of their mouth? And Jesus, Jesus was very quick and pointed about this, telling them. He said, what comes out of your mouth is slander hatred, vulgarity, and abuse towards those who weren't so clean or religious, what they termed religious, people that weren't like them. And Jesus said, evil words come from an evil heart and defile the person who says them. For from the heart come evil thoughts. Our hearts are really, truly evil. And Jesus recognized that. He said, what comes from, a, from our hearts is murder, adultery, and all other sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. You know, when you look at society and you look at yourself, those are things some of us do, and they, they do defile us. Um, and what Jesus, what he couldn't stand about the Pharisees was their, their dishonesty and their hypocrisy and how that they considered themselves before God. <clears throat> So as we go from there, let's, let me give you a few things to think about. You know, according to Jesus, he said what? Purity of heart or an impure heart. It isn't believing the right things. It isn't going through the right motions. But what it really is, it's doing the right things with the right motives. You ought to have the right motives, the right, the right heart inside of you to do what's right. Think about it. You always have to, everything we do, you have a choice. And what those choices are are your motivations. Now, if you praise God with your lips and if you lift your hands up and worship as we just did, you know, that's a good thing. But 
hear, what if you leave here? How do you act this afternoon? Or how do you act on Monday? Or how do you act throughout the week? Um, if you're not acting like you do here, truly worshiping God, if you don't act that way throughout the week, we're no different. We're being hypocrites, just like the Pharisees were. You know, and everything we do here would all be in vain for the week. For as soon as you stop praising God or, or acting the way he wants us to, that's all in vain. Or how about if you all act spiritual in front of each other? You know, we act devious or we're dishonest when no one's looking out there. I talked about having, you know, the right character, do the right thing when no one's looking. You know, if we do those things, then we're hypocrites. We're spiritual hypocrites. Another example is if we teach honesty and integrity to our children. I mean, we need to be examples to our children and to others, but you know, what if, what if you have cable, for example? And I know this has happened to me. I call the cable company and tell them, hey, I want to stop my service, but next month the cable's still coming to the house. For some reason, they forgot to turn the cable off. Now, if I, my children knowing that we still had cable and I wasn't paying for it, that would not be the right thing to do. So we need to put into practice those things that we, we are telling our children. Or how about another thing? We always, we always caution our kids about sexual immorality. <clears throat> but you know, we need to put that into practice as well. If, if you're telling them that, do you sit at home and watch, for example, an R-rated movie and the kids are running around? You know, in those type movies, there's sexual oriented nudity or you know, sexually derived words that the kids shouldn't be hearing. But if we're telling our kids one thing, we're doing another, we're being hypocrites. You know, and the purity of heart isn't believing the right things, like I said. It isn't going through the right motions. It's doing the right things with the right motives, with the right heart. You need to ask yourself before you do something, what will God think of this? That's a good way when you're in a situation. What would God think of what you're about to do? You know, is there consistency about or between what, what you say and what you believe. Not only how would God think about this, or how, how would someone you love think about how you were gonna act? You need to put those, put those questions to mind before you do something. And here's something else to think about. Being pure isn't necessarily just the absence of corruption in your life. You know, it's also the fullness of God's spirit within you. We were talking about this this morning, too. If you were able to rid yourself of all impurity in your life, and I seriously doubt any of us could do that, think back to Adam and Eve. When they, when they were in the Garden of Eden, they had the perfect environment. So, I mean, they basically had nothing that was impure. Everything was provided for them. They walked with God. They heard God's voice. They had all their needs taken care of, but their environment was, was basically pure. But what happened in the Garden? Their hearts, yes, they were tempted. They were given by the devil, you know, an alternative. However, it was their heart, their choice. They were motivated to get something else. So just because you remove, or you think you have removed all impurity from your life, that's not necessarily the answer. But what you really need to do is allow God to fill and occupy the void that you leave. If you do remove all impurity, you need to let God come into your life you know, and if we, if you don't put those things into practice and you're not motivated properly, you're really just a religious do-gooder, just like the Pharisees were. You were hypocrites, just like they were back in Jesus' day. And another thing, purity of heart isn't just the absence of certain things in your life. It's the very presence of God inside you. You know, it begins with shedding all pretense you know, it's an absolute inner awareness of who you really are. You know, anyone I've ever known, I've known a lot of people over the years that, you know, they've conquered a lot of things. They've conquered addictions, they've conquered compulsions, bad attitudes, uh, anger, abusive behavior, fear, anxiety, you name it. People have overcome a lot of things and I've known a lot of people, but you know, their journey began, their journey towards healing, where it really began, was the fact that they recognized that they were helpless, that they needed help. What they did, they gave up any sense that they had their life together. What they had to really do was come to an awareness of who they really were and to turn to God and look for help. They realized that they were helpless. You know, that, 
That's very important. This process of purity begins when you fully understand who you really are, that we are a sinner, and that we need God's forgiveness. We need God's grace in our life. God's love. We were talking about that again this morning, love. We need that true love of God. You know, to have a life that's truly clean in God's eyes, we need to be filled with the very presence of God as well. Now, Jesus told this parable in Luke. Uh, it's in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. Um, he, talked, he gave a parable of two men who prayed. Now, Jesus talks about two guys that were in church. Um, one was a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector who was, who was looked down upon. But what the Pharisee did, he stood out in the open. You know, he stood out where everyone could see him, out in the open, in the light where God could see him. Even though God could see us anyway, he was out there for everyone to see. And he prayed aloud. He said, thank God I'm not a sinner like everyone else I know, especially like that guy over there. All my actions are good. I never do anything wrong. I'm always in church on Sunday. I give a tenth of what I make to God's work. I am truly religious. But the other man in, in the parable Jesus was talking about was that tax collector, the sinner. What he was, he was over in the corner, you know, and he was back in the shadows. But with his trembling voice, what he prayed was, God, forgive me, for I am a sinner. Now, in this, in this parable, what Jesus said was this man and not the other one, not the Pharisee who prayed not to be like this man. This man, the sinner, the tax collector, he was the one that was justified leaving, or he was the one that was pure in heart. And why do you suppose that is? It was because he wasn't a phony. He wasn't a fake. He wasn't a hypocrite like the Pharisee. He was real before God. You know, and God, when you look at that, God can really do something with someone that's like that, that is surrendered to him totally. God can really work in your life if you do that as well. Like we talked about earlier, it's not what's on the outside that matters most to God, but it's what's on the inside, what's in your heart. You know, because what's on the inside, you can't help. Whatever's on your inside is going to work its way to the outside as well. No matter what you think, whatever you say, Whatever is truly inside of you is going to come out as well. And the Bible says, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at the right time and died for us sinners. Jesus didn't die to make you a nice religious church-going person. He died to make us pure. Make us pure on the inside where he sees us the best. When we go back to the, the scripture verse today, too, the second part of this, first of all, we need to be pure in our heart on the inside, but the second part of this is really what's, what's really joy, joyous to hear. It says, for they will see God. So this is the, the last part of this beatitude, or God's promise. We will see God. You know, who did Jesus tell us in this verse would see God? It was only the pure in heart. But what's encouraging, Beatitudes, it's not only what we'll see in heaven, but it's what we can see right here, right now in our life. You know, and as, as Christians, if you truly are pure in your heart, you don't need to wait till, till you get to heaven to see God. You should be able to see God in, right now in this world. We can see, we, we can see God. And there's a number of situations you can see God. You can see God in nature, for example. When you see the beautiful flowers or the trees or the weather, I mean, we just stand in awe of that. We need to be able to see who we are before God right now. Also, you can see it in history, in events that have happened. Um, it's all recorded in the Bible here, but if you look at things that happen to people, things that happen to countries, to nations, I mean, that's God at work. And we have that. We have God's word. And you should be able to see God in your daily life by reading your word. Also, you should have a sense of feeling in your life of God, God's presence. Um, whether you're praying or whether you're in a situation, whether it be a good situation or a bad, you ought to feel God in that situation. You ought to feel him that he's near to you, that he's there to help you. So we can see God here and now in this, in this world as well through your experiences that God is working in your life. 
But like I said, this, the last part of this is such a joyous promise, for they will see God. You know, God reserves intimate fellowship with himself for those who are unmixed in their devotion or unmasked in their relationship with him. You know, the nearer we approach to being pure of heart, the surer you should become of God. And the closer you get to God, the more pure you will be. In your hearts, above all things, we want to see God. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, it says that God has put eternity in the human heart. So it's in, it's in our heart. We know that we are going to live forever. What did I say our heart was? It's our total being, the true man, our mind, our personality, all of that. So we have a longing that we know we are going to live forever. You know, are, you, are, you really, are you really ready to see God like you've never seen him before? Is your desire to know him as intensely as King David did? King David wrote in Psalms 119, verse 58, he said, I have sought your face with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. You know, if so, then it's time to get rid of anything in your life that's keeping you from moving forward. And I was reading the story about this couple. They bought, they were getting ready to retire and they bought a, a speedboat. This guy wanted to go out and pick up water skiing with his, with his wife and he bought a boat. Well, he went, first time he went out to use it, he started it up, the engine was running great. He revved it, it had a lot of power, but he went to move forward and the boat just kind of chugged along. It had no power. The engine was loud, it was running, running great, but the boat just wasn't moving forward. So he kind of limped it out of the dock and he got it out of the open water and he tried to gun it again and the boat just wouldn't go. So he just, he stopped the boat, he looked at the engine, he found there was nothing wrong with it. So he said, I'm, I'm gonna have a real mechanic take a look at the boat, figure out what's wrong with it. When he turned around, went back into the dock and he had the mechanic look at it. The mechanic opened the cowling and he looked at the engine and he said, there's nothing wrong with this motor, it's running fine. So what he decided to do was dive over the side and go take a look at underneath the boat to see if there was any problem. And when he dove under there, what did he see? He saw that the boat was still hitched to the trailer. So what happened is this boat was dragged, the trailer was dragging the boat down. When we look at our lives, how many things do you have that are dragging you down? Things that are weighting you down, keeping you from really having a pure heart before God. I know we have a lot of situations in our life, but, but what's reassuring is God can get us through anything. And this, this is such a, a wonderful verse, um, to know that we will see God. I mean, even Moses couldn't see God. He had to hide in the cleft of the rock where he couldn't see God's face. Um, but we are gonna see God. We, we should be able to see him in our lives now, but that, that is such a wonderful promise that we will see God. But to see him, you what? You have to have a pure heart. And where is your heart today? Are you ready? You know, what, when you look at yourself, your situation, what is your heart filled with? You know, is your heart filled with God? If so, that should make you pure. You might ask yourself, how can I make myself pure? How can I make my heart pure? I think all you can really do is realize that, that our hearts as humans are truly wicked. We have black hearts, we really do. Um, and it's that way by nature. You know, King David again in another prayer, he said, create in me a clean heart. Oh God, renew a right spirit within me. You need to have the confidence that God is working, you, working in your life and preparing you to see him face to face where you can bask in his eternal glory forever. You know, we need to set our, our motivations, our affections on the things above and not things of this impure world. You know, I said, as we look at the scripture, there's been many things written and said about this scripture, one of the Beatitudes, but I think this is truly one of the most amazing things that has ever been said to man in the word. And that's you and I, humans, as, as wretched as we are, the things we're pressed with, all the problems we face in our daily lives, you know, all the troubles, all the things we have to deal with in this world, I think it's just so reassuring, so, so loving, so peaceful, so comforting to know that we are going to see God face to face forever. So no matter what your situation is, no matter what you're going through, I think this, this verse 
should give you the true motivation to live the life that God wants you to live. So I ask you, do you have a pure heart? If not, be like King David and truly repent and live the life that God wants you to live. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. We recognize that you are God. Everything around us, we are just in awe of it, Lord, but we are truly in awe of you, for you are God. You created us, you know us, and you know what motivates us. You know what our thoughts are. You know what our actions are like. But Lord, we recognize the fact that we are human. We are imperfect in your eyes. However, we are so thankful that you still love us despite all of our impurities, despite the fact that that we don't live the way you want us to live all the time. But Lord, let us truly be encouraged by your word, your word today, Lord, that we have the promise that we will see you face to face and we will be in your presence forever. We thank you, Lord, for your word, for your truth. We may use it and apply it in our daily lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.